and thank you for joining us for Northwest Newsweek. I'm Riley McManus. The city of Dryden has passed its 2022 budget and for the first time in a while, residents will see an increase in rates. As well, the city will be dipping into its reserves to pay for some expected costs which came out of the decision to disband its police service in favor of the OPP. As Adam Riley explains, those costs become a point of tense discussions for some members. 3.91%, that is how much more Dryden property owners will be paying in taxes this year following the passage of the city's 2022 budget. That increase will net the city $570,000, will help it counter a $1.1 million increase in operating costs without cutting services. It includes an estimated $1.7 million for uniform police disbandment costs, an estimated $372,000 for civilian police disbandment costs, a one-time $723,000 OPP startup cost and a one-time $416,000 OPP facility upgrade for the Highway 17 detachment. Those costs will be covered through various reserve funds, which didn't sit well with Councillor Shane McKinnon, who is a vocal opponent of the decision to disband the DPS. We're going to use uh, legacy money, which is in fact uh, uh, renamed from uh, the hydro um, proceeds that we had a number of years ago. We're going to exhaust our emergency reserve. We're going to leave uh, out of the uh, 400 and some thousand dollars and then we're going to leave $18,000. McKinnon dubbed the budget the police transition budget of 2022, noting historically when budgets are increased, they rarely decrease thereafter and called the 3.9% increase the legacy of the transition. He also noted the decision for a water and sewer increase of 10% will leave the city in a rut of sorts. We're essentially putting us ourselves back into a position where we can't make any moves uh, financially um, on our own because now we've incurred uh, another debt. Some tense interactions came following McKinnon's assertion in his closing comments that 80% of residents supported the continuation of the DPS over the OPP, which raised the ire of fellow councillor Dave McKay. 87% was the number that was gleaned out of the first uh, costing study, and you can look that up if you'd like. Uh, yeah, but that has nothing to do with with uh, <clears throat> the outcome of the second uh, costing, so you may get up the number. Just to be clear... Um, no, no, no. I, I, I don't want to argue with you about that, but you can well, go then, back and look... Don't put out numbers that you can't substantiate. Yeah. It's water under the bridge. The budget was passed with five councillors in favour and none opposed, as McKinnon abstained from the vote. Adam Riley... TBT News. The roof of a bargain store in Sioux Lookout has collapsed, but fortunately, no one was hurt. It happened at 6 o'clock Thursday evening at the Red Apple store on Front Street, about one hour before the business was scheduled to close. Photos posted on social media show a large portion of the roof collapsed into the store. Sioux Lookout Fire Chief Robert Popowich says there were four employees and no customers inside the store at the time, and all staff managed to evacuate safely. Emergency officials closed off the street for safety reasons. Local residents recall a similar collapse which happened at the same building around 30 years ago. Popowich says despite the heavy snowfall this winter, flat flat-roofed buildings should still be able to withstand the weight of the snow. It'll be up to the store's insurance company to investigate the cause. A funding request to help the town of Scriber with federally mandated upgrades to its sewer treatment plant have been denied by upper levels of government. That's left the community in a tough position, which could lead to a substantial increase in water and sewer rates. The plant is nearing 50 years in age, and in order for the $1.2 million upgrade to phase out chlorine and replace it with UV light to treat the waste, an extra $700,000 in electrical work is required. The latest funding request to the FedNOR was turned down, which according to Scriber CAO Nathan Diaz, means they're back to square one. He says money from higher levels of government would allow the municipality to not have to pay for the project entirely themselves which he estimates would require a 42% increase in sewer rates. That method would have a big impact both on residents and anyone currently operating or looking to operate a commercial property in Scriber. To prevent that and get the work started, the town is breaking the project down into phases. That way gives us the opportunity, if down the road that we see suitable funding, that we would be able to then pursue the rest of that uh, uh, scope of work, go at it phase by phase. That being said, there's some strategy in doing these things. Right now, there's a very low interest rate. <laughs> 
if we were to take the financing for the entire project, right, that, that may work out very well. But uh, if we do that, then we lose the opportunity of pursuing grants down the, down the line. Phase one of the upgrade is expected to have a price tag of $170,000, which will require a small increase to the sewer rate. However, Diaz was unable to provide an estimate for the rate increase for that aspect of the project. The town of Marathon is whittling down to the list of candidates to replace one of its members of council, following the resignation of Chantel Zingras. Zingras was, one of, was on council for just short of eight years, but has taken a job with the municipality as a head librarian. Rules that govern municipalities do not allow employees of the municipality to serve on council. With the next municipal election just seven months away, council has opted to take applications from members of the public, from which they will then choose the replacement. Acting Mayor Greg Valance says they have a list of five names who will be interviewed this month, and he says they'll have a tough choice ahead of them. From those five candidates, we got a really strong pool of uh, individuals that kind of represent every sector within the community, employment sector, healthcare, education. So we're really, really excited and we're really um, fortunate for the individuals who did step up and we're looking forward to, uh, yeah, filling that seat. Valance is hopeful the experience gained by the applicants will make them want to put their names forward again for the fall election. Tragedy has struck a remote First Nations community as COVID-19 takes its toll. The loss of three members in Casabonica Lake has been confirmed by leaders with the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Nan posted to social media offering condolences to the community that currently has the highest number of positive cases throughout the Nan territory. Active cases in Casabonica reached as high as 120 on Monday before dropping to 86 by Tuesday. Casabonica's COVID cases are overseen by the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority. That agency is reporting 446 active cases across more than 20 communities. Meanwhile, the Northwestern Health Unit continues to see high positivity rates at over 26% as of Monday. Medical Officer of Health Dr. Kit Young-Hoon is concerned that that may rise with the loosening of provincial restrictions. We would it definitely we will be monitoring all the statistics very closely with the lifting of restrictions today. Um, so uh, I think this may have an impact, but it's hard to see. We are a geography of um, lower population density. Medical officers of health in Ontario are no longer allowed to issue letters of instructions to organizations or businesses. There are more and more indications that Ontario's mask mandate will be dropped before the end of March. District Medical Officer of Health Dr. Janet DeMille says she's just hopeful that whenever that time comes, those with opposing viewpoints will be polite to one another and the vulnerable population will be considered. Corey Nordstrom has the details. It appears the province's mask mandate will not be in place by the end of March. That would be the final domino to fall in Doug Ford's reopening plan, though no official date has been given. Dr. Janet DeMille says she wants that decision to be made with all of the data in mind and to not be rushed. Really considering the people that remain vulnerable, uh, people who are older in age, people who have um, uh, underlying conditions, people who are immunocompromised or on treatments that may in, cause them to be immunocompromised, and make sure that any decisions that are made are, are inclusive of all that. Premier Ford has stated that his government is not far away from dropping Ontario's masking mandate, hinting that it could come following March break. Now, DeMille did not want to speculate on those timelines, only saying that when the announcement is made, she hopes people are respectful of one another despite differing views. It kind of has divided us in many ways because of differences of opinions that people have had. And what we do need to do is, as part of our recovery from the pandemic is really uh, try to recover from that as well. Earlier in the week, the province did away with capacity limits and vaccine passports. DeMille would have preferred the province stuck with its initial March 14th date for those two elements of reopening, noting the impacts it could have on the level of COVID cases locally and those who are still unvaccinated. And I do have a bit of concern for people who have chosen to remain unvaccinated, that if they are now uh, out and about more, going to the cinema, going to a restaurant, 
that they have actually a higher risk of potentially getting COVID. DeMille encourages anyone who has yet to get immunized to visit the CLE clinic. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. When we come back, municipal and healthcare leaders in Marathon react and look forward to a future that of a new long-term care wing will do for seniors along the North Shore. An announcement by the province last month that will bring a total of 54 new long-term care beds to the northwest is being welcomed by health care and municipal leaders in Marathon. The town's share of 14 new beds are expected to free up space in the hospital and allow older residents who have had to leave their community the chance to come home. Adam Riley has the details. Come spring or summer of 2024, 14 residents from the Marathon area will have access to new long-term care beds following an announcement last month by Ontario Long-Term Care Minister Paul Calandra. It comes at a time where the Wilson Memorial Hospital, where the new wing will be built to accommodate those beds, currently uses its chronic care wing to act as what North of Superior Health Care Group CEO Adam Brown calls quasi-long-term care beds. He says the new beds will allow a shift and give them some breathing room on the capacity front, noting back to a similar situation when Wilkes Terrace and Terrace Bay was built. At the time, the McCausen Hospital was overrun with uh, occupancy. It was running 120% occupancy uh, for several years prior to opening Wilkes Terrace. And almost immediately, we filled up Wilkes Terrace, the 22 beds in Terrace Bay. And the chronic wing sat relatively empty for a number of years. So it's now taken, that's 11 years since we opened. It's taken now 11 years until that chronic wave is kind of filled back up to capacity. Brown notes the design features a 7,000 square foot addition to the east end of the hospital. And with it being incorporated into the hospital itself, it won't require a kitchen or mechanical rooms. Acting Mayor Greg Valance says this project is great news for Marathon. We're looking really forward to kind of rounding out our health care system here in the community and having these long-term care beds will allow us that opportunity and it's going to allow us the opportunity to maintain that aging demographic within the community and keeping those individuals as they access health care services with their family. Valance adds there will also be an economic spin-off from the jobs created both in the construction and the operation of the long-term care wing. Other communities in the region include Atacokan and Manitowage, who are getting 22 and 18 long-term care beds, respectively. While some might think of those numbers as unusual, Brown says they work very well with the new requirement set by the province. To have four hours per resident per day of care, so that's some new legislation that was recently introduced, and that 14 beds fits nicely into you know four-hour shift patterns. 
uh, 16 wouldn't work as well, 12 wouldn't work as well, so you'd have to go from 14, perhaps up to 18, and perhaps up to 22 to make it work. Once the design and engineering is complete, shovels are expected to be in the ground spring of 2023. Adam Riley, TBT News. Later this month, the largest infrastructure project the North Shore region has seen in decades will be completed. And with that, the work camps for the East-West High will begin to shut down. The project, valued at $777 million, is a 230-kilovolt transmission line that runs from Shunya to Wawa. It provided an economic boost for many of the communities along the North Shore over the past three years. Marathon acted as a hub community, which included supplies, housing, and renting of space, such as a former pulp mill property for Laydown Yard and a former schoolyard used for the Ballard Work Camp. Marathon's acting mayor, Grade Philance, says considering the economic hardships faced during the pandemic, the project couldn't have come at a better time. We're extremely fortunate for what Ballard brought and Nextbridge brought to the community as a corporate citizen, really. We were extremely fortunate to have them, especially within that crucial time of it being the pandemic. The, the spinoff on, again, the economics of employment and what they brought to the retail sector and money into those organizations throughout the pandemic, we've been extremely fortunate. The East-West tie is expected to be completed in the coming weeks and then electrified on March 31st. Last month, the WSIB announced a long-awaited policy change for mine workers who were exposed to McIntyre powder many decades ago. They will now be automatically approved for claims relating to Parkinson's disease. But the activists and retired miners here in the Northwest who have been fighting for the change say so they aren't done yet. Lee Noonan has the details. The use of aluminum powder, called McIntyre powder, was declared dangerous in 1979, but the first clues that the product might be harming miners came much earlier, only a few years after it was first introduced in the early 1940s as a treatment to protect against silicosis. The activists behind the McIntyre powder project are now calling on the government of Ontario to formally apologize. Paul Filto has been a lifelong advocate for miners' rights. His father was exposed to McIntyre powder when he returned to the mines after serving in World War II. His father was denied workman's compensation even though his health had started to decline when he was still in his 40s. I started noticing the shaking going on and started getting forgetful, things like he liked to photograph things and he had difficulty holding the camera. And coordination, uh, we got our first car in 1954 it wasn't too long after I began to notice, like I was, you know, I'm a little kid at this time, but I see that he's having difficulty braking, coordinating and driving with the braking, which is kind of scary, you know. Hugh Carlson's WSIB claim was also denied. Despite the opinions of his doctors, his sarcoidosis isn't recognized as related to the McIntyre powder he was exposed to working in Red Lake area gold mines as a young man. And they were well-meaning when they thought, well, we'll coat their lungs with aluminum and it'll protect them from the silica dust and hence protect them from silicosis. And so everybody sat in there and they sprayed aluminum dust in the, in the air. You can smell the, the something the foul in the air. Like it was just sort of something that everybody accepted. Finn Anderson retired as a driller many years ago, but he learned only last week that his Parkinson's may have been caused by his career in the mines. I, I knew about it when they were doing it. Well, I, when, I, when I found out that it had caused Parkinson's, I, that got me concerned because I, I've had that for 22 years now. I guess the environmental uh, uh, health effects of working underground, what are they? And does the Workmen's Compensation Board recognize them? Ultimately, everyone we spoke to for this story was more concerned for future miners than for themselves. They hope to see changes to the WSIB that will put the well-being of miners before the agency's bottom line. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Coming up after the break, a local sled dog racer takes top prize at a national level race.
A Sioux Lookout man is fresh off a victory at Canada's premier dog sled race, and he's looking for another win this weekend. Jesse Terry took first place in the Canadian Challenge sled dog race, which wrapped up last Saturday in northern Saskatchewan. Corey Nordstrom has the story. After a combined 43 hours and 28 minutes, Sioux Lookout's Jesse Terry crossed the finish line to take home his first Canadian Challenge sled dog race victory. Terry has been racing sled dogs since he was 11, though took a hiatus from 2015 to 2020 before competing again, and was overjoyed to come out on top. One of the most special things about the whole experience was the fact that I had a bunch of my family that was there at the race as well. My wife, Mary Anglin, was running another team in the race, um, as well as our two children um, were able to meet me at the finish line, uh, Tivai and Miali. The 200-mile race concluded February 24th, and knowing he and his dogs would be able to squeeze in the necessary rest following the race in Saskatchewan, Terry looked towards the next adventure on the East Coast. We had a day and a half turnaround when we got home from Saskatchewan in the Canadian Challenge to unpack, repack, and get ready for our next race. Now the 38-year-old is in Madawaska, Maine for the 250-mile Can-Am Crown. To him, having fun is the goal, though he wants to compete, noting that it will be a brand new experience. There is a lot of, a lot of more competition at this race, and uh, we'll see how it goes. It's a new race to me, it's a new trail. Uh, it's supposed to be quite warm on Sunday, it's supposed to be above zero on Sunday, and it certainly slows the race down for everyone. Terry's progress can be followed on the Can-Am Crown's website. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. Emergency alerts for Dryden are getting modernized into the 21st century as the city adopts a new digital alert system geared towards reaching more residents than the current system. For years, if an emergency were to occur, that would require an evacuation or residents to stand by for information, several sirens would go off and residents would tune in to a local radio broadcast. However, that system has become outdated, so the city has adopted the Voyant Alert System, which residents can register for through the city's website. Fire Chief Chris Wood says the old system had a limited area of coverage and often caused panic for residents when the system would go off accidentally. Once registered, Wood says they should an, an emergency occur, residents will get an alert through several very, different very platforms. It's a very, very detailed notification that will come through the app if you have it. If you don't, you can get it by email, uh, text message, uh, or an automated phone call where you just pick up the phone and it will, it will re relay that information back. Um, so, so that's one piece. If we get down to you know, a, an immediate area where we need to evacuate or have uh, you know, emergency messaging we have to get through, uh, we would be right down to, to using community partners and, and driving through streets and, and loudspeakers. So we have many different ways to communicate emergency information. Wood says aside from evacuations, the system could be used for road closures, boil water advisories and gas leaks. So far, close to 600 people have signed up for the service, which is also used and being explored by a number of other municipal municipalities in the region. A virtual event this week hosted by Diversity Thunder Bay, geared towards informing residents of the legacy of the Indian residential school system, took a dive into the tools and current search for unmarked burial sites. These instruments are seen as the silver bullet that will solve all of our problems. No. It's a technique that has enormous potential, but there are things it cannot see. There are things it cannot detect. In 2013, Hamilton started research on behalf of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to help identify possible residential school burial sites. He outlined that process in the presentation and showed the multiple tools that can be used to uncover these sites. They range from satellite imaging and drones to ground penetrating radar. And he says it takes multiple tools to see the whole picture. Here in the Thunder Bay area, Hamilton says the community needs time to reach a consensus on an appropriate way forward. And after they have had the time to develop their position and their stance, then we will perhaps be invited to participate in the process, participate in the debate. Um, it's not something that people who are not part of those communities can really slam dance all over this issue. We have to wait until it's appropriate. And that wraps up Northwest Newsweek.
Thank you so much for joining us.